Hello, this is Brian Perry with the Florida Aviation Network. Today, we're once again at the Regional Air Cargo Carrier Association uh, Conference in Scottsdale, Arizona. Today, we're visiting with Earl Lawrence of X-Wing, and he's been telling us about the, the new technology and, and automation for aircraft operations and what we can expect. So we're going to have a nice little discussion and get the rest of us up to speed. Good afternoon, Earl. How are you doing? Good afternoon, Brian. I am doing great. It's great to be here at the Rocket Convention. Um, it's great talking to fellow regional air cargo operators and, uh, you know, learning from what each of us, are, our operations are like and what we can do to improve um, um, our, not just our operations, but also the designs that we're working on with our automation programs for caravans. Okay. So it sounded like not it's not necessarily going to require building new aircraft, just modifying the, capable, the capabilities of some. So that's going to save money, I would hope, in the long run. Absolutely. So that's one of the strategies of our X-Wing project. We're, we're taking the Cessna 208 and we're automating it and we're moving the pilot to the ground and uh, allowing remote operations. And one of the things that we think is, is critical for the cargo market is the fact that um, it's a low margin business and cargo aircraft are usually aircraft that have had a long history already of operations. And so modifying existing proven designs um, to be remotely piloted, um, we think is the, the appropriate thing to do, not just because of cost, but because of safety. Because now we know exactly how these operations have been over the years, and we, we have a proven safety record to work from. Okay, that's great. Uh, using the same, it's almost like getting an annual and everything to go along with it uh, to refurbish it. So it sounds great. Um, and then the long history, and of course the margins, it's like, okay, if we can get more, you mentioned getting more use out of the aircraft by not having to wait you know, having the pilots wait in different areas and stuff. Tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. Well, one of the big advantages of de uh, of detaching the pilot from the aircraft is that um, we have more um, ability to use the aircraft. So right now on a normal cargo run, um, the pilot gets up very early in the morning. They fly maybe an hour out to uh, an airport where they're delivering it. And then because of the pilot rest time requirements, they now go to a hotel for 12 hours, <laughs> okay? And they get their required pilot, they need their pilot rest time, and then do the return flight at night. Um, the reason why they have to do it that way is the time in between returning from the night flight and the morning flight doesn't give sufficient number of hours for a normal pilot rest. By detaching um, the pilot from the aircraft, um, the aircraft can now just continue to operate and, you know, the pilot, one pilot can fly in one aircraft and then go to another aircraft and fly that one. So you, know, you can fly one aircraft out at, at one for one hour and then go and fly another aircraft out and you can keep flying it throughout the day. So um, some of the larger cargo uh, operations, things like entities like UPS and FedEx and that are looking to take advantage of the aircraft so it doesn't sit all day long yeah. waiting for a pilot to become qualified again. Gives you an opportunity to uh, get better utilization out of those uh, aircraft, and that reduced costs for everyone. Yeah, yeah because it it's not instantaneous to unload and reload an aircraft, and the pilots, okay, I'm stuck here until that's done, right. and then it, but it, it, with the time, okay, I'm now over at the end of my crew day. Sure. So, uh, so that's all you know. Being uh, efficient. Um, this now you were talking about the certification process. That's where the FAA comes in. You know, not only for safety, but okay, interfacing with everything. Uh, that seems like it's a it's a ongoing process. May well be until everything's been said and done for years. But tell us a little bit about how that's going. Sure. Re really, when you're looking at certification and aviation, you're really talking about three different areas. You have people, you have hardware, and you have airspace. Okay. So when we're talking about hardware. That's the aircraft itself, the components on it, the aircraft certification. And so in this case, we're taking aircraft that are already certified, adding another certified set of equipment on there to automate controls and things like that. When it comes to people that are certified, our pilots are current fully qualified pilots, but also you have to remember, you, have to, you also have to have approvals and oversight from the FAA for 
um, the maintenance, mm -hmm. for the loaders, for the people who do weight and balance and dispatching and all of that. So you still have that oversight. And then, of course, the airspace itself, the, the, the rules of the air, so to speak, instead of rules of the road, the rules of the air. And um, you, you have to um, work with the FAA to get those airspace approvals as well. So it's all three of them. And what we've been working on right now is completing our certification of our hardware. Um, we're an existing air carrier. Um, Martin Air, so we have our existing pilots already approved and, and our training for our ground personnel and all that done. And so um, once we have the STC done and, and of course we have our ground crew certified, um, we'll have to get our airspace approvals. Mm -hmm. And we've been working with air traffic control on that um, already. In fact, we've been operating an aircraft in, in what we call the uh, research and development category. And we've been operating it now for several years um, in, in, as an automated aircraft going um, gate to gate, um, fully automated. So taxi, takeoff, en route, and landing, and taxi again to a spot, all using our automation systems, but it's all in the testing phase. But that's worked well with air, air traffic, and we've had those approvals. So um, it's a, a long, hard roll, you know, road to, still to go, but um, we just have to finish our demonstration of our, our safety and certify our hardware. Now, of those three groups, have there been any that gave more pushback than any one others, or some that actually gave you pushback that you didn't expect? Um, uh, actually, what I've been surprised about is the lack of pushback we've actually had, and the embracing of the ideas, at least the way we proposed it. Now, we have to show we can do what we are proposing, um, but for example, um, in, you know, our air traffic controllers that we've worked with have been very accommodating and say, they can't tell the difference between us and a manned aircraft, and so, other than the fact that we are more precision in our flying, <laughs> um, which they appreciate, and, and it's, it's, it's very easy for them. Um, when it comes to certification of our personnel, you know, that's very standard and not really new. And so the hard part is um, presenting what we call in the aircraft certification world is new and novel. And so when you say new and novel, that raises a lot of questions, and, and rightly so, because we have to show not only that we're in compliance with the existing regulations, but also that we're not introducing any known unsafe conditions to the system so that, that this, these systems can operate safely. So our detect and avoid system, our takeoff, our automatic landing, and all the different um, components of what we're adding onto the aircraft. And so I wouldn't say it's resistance, it's just a lot of work and explanation to, sh you know, to show. That's the other thing, um, you know, with FAA, you know, you, the, you, the applicant shows to the FAA and the, and the FAA finds. <laughs> um, and so we, we're, we're doing a lot of showing right now and uh, working on our findings from the FAA. Okay, great, now I was just thinking, you know, so many times an accident say, oh, it's human, human error. So I, I should expect with less human controls where th there could be that error, that safety would potentially go up. I, that is what our proposal is. So we firmly believe that. Um, for example, our system um, is automating the checklist that the pilots follow. So um, sometimes in an emergency, the pilot's expected to have it memorized, right? And to know what those things I, uh, uh, are. I, I don't know about you, but this human doesn't always remember every one of those steps as perfectly as a computer um, does. And it, you know, it always does every step. It never misses any. Um, I'm not, I don't want to make it say, it, try to say it's better than a human or worse, but um, you can program it with the accidents and the learning that we've had over all these years and make sure it doesn't make those mistakes again. And um, in that sense, um, I think we'll see extremely good safety record with it. And I think it will, it will address some of the pilot fatigue um, and pilot mistakes that we, we see in our accident record today. Okay, that's great. Now I can also see that uh, 
you know, as a decision-making process of the automated system, it's getting feedback of the, you know, accident reports, and then it, it's using some sort of weighted measure of, okay, this is what the situation is, how should I respond? Well, I'm mean, not so much on, on directly that way. I think what you're, but that's the idea behind it, is learn from the past, build it into the system. Um, what we do now in, a, in the, quote, manned environment, is we learn from the past and we update the checklist that the pilots follow. So, um, and in our case, they will always follow the checklist, okay, or, or updating the training requirements. Well, the training requirement is the software that is approved to go on the aircraft. So um, in that sense, they, we won't have those, those mistakes and we'll have that learning. Now, there'll be new learnings and something else will happen and then we'll update the programming to, to work on that learning as well. Okay. Now, what do you see? I'm going to bypass the idea of new training for pilots and everything, because that's still need to be worked out. But what do you see as a timeline optimal that everything will be in, in, put together and like okay, at the worst case, when everybody's fighting back, we should have it by such and such. Well, I I, I like to think of it as um, there's many of us in the community that are automating, and and automation is inevitable. Um, and I'll point out why it's inevitable because aircraft has had automation now for over a hundred years. Okay. And we've had autopilots for over a hundred years. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of amazing when you think about it. And we've been automating systems on aircraft to make them safer. And man, so we're going to, this is just a continuation of that. So when you say, oh, give me a date. Well, we just have more automation every year and it just get you know, it, we're just going to have more and more. Um, the kind of things that we're talking about at X-Wing when you're starting to have uh, the systems that we have in a civil certification, I think are three to five years time frames um, is when you're going to start to see them in, in operation. And I want to remind us all that, you know, the military have had these aircraft in, and remote operations in, in operation in our national airspace system for 20 years now, if not longer. Um, so this isn't new. It's just now making its way into the civilian world and making its way in um, from a cost standpoint and a technology standpoint is something that may be affordable that, that can enter this marketplace. Now I can also imagine, I think you alluded to societal changes and how we look at automation. You know, everybody's stuck in their phone and it's like, okay, <laughs> how do you think that's playing? Is it going to make it easier for transition to this automated technologies and implementation and uh, because of what we've gained use of on the side outside of oh, aviation? A absolutely. I, I mean, you look at automation period, um, we, we've all grown more and more accustomed to it uh, for, as a society. Um, I, I like bringing up the old analogy. We may not think of, I don't know how much the, the current generation would even think about this, but we used to have elevator operators. Mm -hmm. Literally, I mean, when you go way back, they actually operated it and moved it up and down. But for years, we had people who literally just stood on the elevator and hit the button that said, yes, you'd like to go to floor number such as that. And, and hit, you know, close, hit the close the door button, open the door. But it still did everything automatic, but we still retained people to do that. Well, why? That was something that society was comfortable with. And it was kind of an expectation that there was somebody there to operate the, you know, elevator. Um, you know, we're long past those days, right? Well, every once in a while, you see a kid running in. Maybe we should need them still. Yeah, there, there you go. Maybe. Um, it, it, uh, uh, but but it, it's just the example of how, as you said, especially with the advent of iPhones and computers and, you know, we're now so used to hitting a button and expecting things to happen automatically. Um, software... Um, has changed. Computers have improved dramatically they, every year, right? And that's when I was talking about maybe affordability and meeting the, you know, the civil market. Mm -hmm. You know, having a flight control computer, which from an FAA standpoint is a very high standard to meet the certification requirements. Um, I don't think 10 years ago even, um, we could have built an affordable flight control computer um, that could meet all the certification requirements and meet the needs. Affordable for a cargo market. Aff you know, we had flight control computers for Boeing and Airbus and you know very large airliners and things like that. 
but you got to you know those co those computers themselves cost more than the entire aircraft we're using to operate in the cargo environment. So um, you know costs continue to come down in the computing world, and so it, it makes it more accessible and doable to do to add this automation into the aircraft. You sort of mentioned about making sure the pilots were adequately trained. Do you think? if we move away from the basic flying skills, that there may be a loss of skills when you're used to just hitting a button? Um, I actually think we're leaving that, we're living that reality today. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like an old curmudgeon because um, I, I, I like yeah. to. I mean, I remember when I was getting my IFR rating, we all complained about having to do a, you know, NDB approach, non-directional, you know, antenna, because it, it, it's a non-automated, there's no map, there's all the, you know, you're, it's a needle kind of a thing. Um, but we all did it. And, you know, but the previous generation, well, of course you, you know how to do that. And, and it's like, do you have to know that? No, you don't need to do that. Now we have GPS and we got a moving map and, you know, so there's not, nothing wrong with it. But obviously we don't have those skills anymore. We've lost those skills of, of doing those old procedures. Um, so there's that scenario. And then there's what you're talking about is we're automating things. The ability to do, have stick and rudder skills, you know, when, the, when systems fail. And, and so I think this has been just part of the debate in the aviation community as we're making this transition, do you leave the human? Is it better to literally jump to a fully automated system? Because if you still rely on a human being jumping in in the middle of an emergency and they haven't been flying the aircraft and they don't have that experience, is that more dangerous than just making the next step and saying, no, we're going to automate everything. We're still going to have an, a human oversee it, but we're going to, we're going to do full automation. So it's just, I think we're in the middle of that discussion and there's no single right answer. It's just a journey that we're all on and it's all of our jobs from both a government and an industry standpoint to manage safety along that along this path, right, and um, to keep things. But we, I think we've got to all admit, we've never been safer in aviation. Mm -hmm. So whatever we're doing <laughs> um, seems to be good. Um, so things have changed. New equipment, yeah, we probably lost skills in certain areas, um, but our overall safety record continues to improve, and as long as it does, I, that's, I think we continue on this journey. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of an example. When I first started in B-52 as a navigator, I was doing Celestial. Yes. Um, over the years, everything's moved to GPS, and along with that, the crew position has changed from navigator or bombardier to operator. Yes. Do you think that'll happen to the pilots also? Um, I, I don't know whether the names will officially change. One of the things that's unique in the aviation community is, is we, we say pilot and command for a reason. And that is because they are the human that is responsible, legally responsible for all of those operations. So I know a lot of people like to say, well, they're an operator now, but legally they're still responsible. They're responsible for that flight. They're responsible for any passengers or cargo or equipment or anything on there. And so um, I don't know whether that'll actually change or, or not, but I, as a uh, ex-FAA uh, official, I know that was important to us, that we were retaining a person who was actually responsible and, and was taking on that, um, that, that authority to make sure that operation was safe. So, but if the the aircraft is remote, they're delegating that authority for walk around and stuff like that. Um, correct, but that's not again unusual on yeah. you know today in air carrier world um, for airlines to have you know have a me mechanics go out and do the checks on the aircraft and then notify the pilot we we checked the following things and they're good. So that's not a new concept. That's actually an old concept. We're just expanding it to more aircraft. Yeah. Okay. Well, Earl, thank you very much for spending time. Uh, you. If you have more to this day, we're, we'll let you say it, but I don't want to hold you back if you got things to do. Well, thank you, Brian. It's great to chat with you for a little bit, and uh, uh, I look forward to uh, chatting with you more in the future. I would love to do that, maybe even at Sun and Fun. It's always good <laughs> to be in an air show. Yeah. Well, once again, this is Brian Perry with Florida Aviation Network, live and in the clear from the Regional Air, Car Air Cargo Carriers Association Conference in Scottsdale, Arizona for 2023. Have a good day. Three.